you on, Bernie. You can stand up for the rest of the evening. Uh, for those uh, who haven't uh, filled out one of these, the church has uh, a lot of these are response cards, just so we can kind of keep track of who's here. If you send your hate mail, uh, no, so we know that you're here, and uh, we can let you know next year we are going to be back here, uh, April 28 and 29, I believe it is. Let's look at April of next year, uh, and we'd like to see you. Join us again and bring a friend. Now, we're going to take up a free will offering tomorrow. We would do it today, but I didn't warn anyone to give me an offering basket. So, uh, so fill these out and uh, pray how the Lord might lead for you to help support the ministry of EMR as we continue on with this. Uh, I have uh, the honor to introduce a fellow board member. Uh, I'd like to call him a friend, but he might, uh, he might not agree with that. Like, I'm going, to, I'm going to pretend he's my friend, though. See, if it was Bill Hunter, I would know how to answer that because I'm on his rent a friend. <laughs> Dr. Robert Stewart, he's professor of philosophy and theology and Greer Hurd, uh, professor of faith and culture at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. See, I can read, too. Uh, his academic work focuses on philosophy of religion, Christian apologetics, Christian theology, historical Jesus research, and new religions. He has authored or edited 12 books and numerous articles in journals and books edited by others. Uh, his most recent book is What Did the Cross Accomplish? A Conversation About the Atonement with N.T. Wright and Simon Gatherpold. Yeah. Uh, and uh, his, the topic on is A. Apologetics, Lessons in Counterpoint Apologetics and the Apostle Paul. One of the things I have to just appreciate on a personal level is uh, I have a few people, Bob uh, Stewart is one of them, Dr. Uh, James Gerstead is another one, who tend to sometimes temper me <laughs> because I get exasperated with things I see happening in the church. And uh, from time to time, Bill Hunsberger will call me and remind me God loves the church. And I need to hear that because I get angered at some things I see in the church. So it is God's church. We are along for the bride. God is a central character in scripture. We are character actors in his story. And it is important to hear from those who have kind of gone ahead of us, learned academically more than I may ever know, and taught other students how to use this for the benefit of the work of Christ. Because that's really what we're here for. Reaching the lost with the gospel and challenging the saved in discipleship so they too can reach the lost with the gospel. And so I'm going to ask my friend, Dr. Robert Stewart, to come up and speak to us tonight. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> I do. Uh, I hope you got uh, got a handout uh, that may uh, help you in uh, in taking notes. If if you are not Type A, then you probably don't need it. But um, if you want it, uh, it's an aid. It's helpful. And uh, my wife is not with me. Uh, she frequently uh, prevents me from taking trips to a place called Philosophy Land uh, that she doesn't like me to go to because uh, uh, one definition of a philosopher is someone who tells you what you already know in language that you cannot understand. But, uh, I'm unashamed of it. I am a philosopher. And uh, so this is a apologetics. Uh, that is not my idea for the title. Um, I'm not that clever. I have to give credit to my friend Tala Anderson, who gave me that title when I did a lecture similar to this at Oklahoma Baptist a couple of years ago. So let's uh, let's get to it right away. Paul was the first Christian missionary. Now Paul was not the first uh, Jewish believer to win a non-Jew uh, to Christ. Uh, there had been Samaritans uh, come to faith. An Ethiopian eunuch had come to faith. A Roman uh, uh, centurion named Cornelius 
had uh, converted to Christianity prior to Paul's missionary work. But he and Barnabas were the first to engage in vocational missionary work. We have this uh, uh, example in Acts 13 where uh, the church at Antioch is ministering and fasting and, and coming before the Lord and the Holy Spirit says, set apart Barnabas and Saul to the work that I have for them. Well, one thing that all missionaries have to do is to contextualize their message, to fit the culture that they're trying to reach. We should have a slide up here that says contextualize. There we go. All right. And uh, contextualization is simply taking the message of the gospel or some part of the Christian worldview and translating it so that it is both understandable and meaningful uh, in a different culture or to a different culture. And this is important for us to do as missionaries to non-Christian religions. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, making it understandable uh, is, is a big part of the task. Uh, many of you know that uh, Mormons and Christians uh, largely use the same terms and in fact, the, the talk in this room uh, right before I got up to do this uh, by Bill McKeever brought this out very well, that, that we use the same terms, but we mean radically different things. For instance, uh, the LDS believe in God the Father, but the, the Father is an exalted man with a physical body who has a wife. And so what we see is that uh, Mormons use our vocabulary but their own dictionary. And so we have to be, be clear, but we also have to be relevant. We need to uh, talk about things that matter to them. For instance, uh, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they're confused about a lot of things. They're confused about who God is. They're confused about who Jesus is. They're confused about what salvation is. But when I talk to a Jehovah's Witness, I don't start by talking about God. I don't start by talking about Jesus. I don't start by, by talking about salvation. And, the, and people say, why don't you? Because they are a millennial group. And what they care about is Armageddon. So I talk about Armageddon. I talk about the things that can be tested in this life. Things like Armageddon. Things like it will happen in 1914, or 1918, or 1925, or 1975. And as James Walker is fond of saying, most of those times it did not happen. And, and so we need not only to be clear in what we're saying, we also need to be uh, relevant. We need to talk about what they care about. Now Paul was an evangelist. Uh, to Jews and Greeks and Romans. Jews and Greeks and Romans. So when Paul presented and defended the gospel to Jews, he understood where they were coming from because he was a Jew. And so he used their shared scripture, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, and their shared history, culturally. And Acts 13 is, is a great example of this, and it's the best example of Paul commending the gospel to his fellow Jews. And so we need to look at his method uh, with Jewish uh, people for sharing the gospel. Number one, he says that God chose Israel to be his unique people and a light to the Gentiles. Number two, he stresses that God promised to send Messiah to deliver Israel. And that Jesus came in the power of the Spirit, but his own people. The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, not all Jews, but the, the Jewish leaders rejected their Messiah and put him to death. But God raised Jesus from the dead to vindicate him as the Messiah. And thus repentance is called for in light of what God had done through Jesus the Messiah. This is Paul's basic message over and over in one form or another to Jews. 
Now, if, if you have your Bible open or your cell phone open uh, to a Bible app, I, I'd like you uh, to make a note or maybe go to it very quickly and compare this that, uh, that we find uh, from Paul with, um, in Acts 13 with what Peter preaches in Acts 2. What Peter preaches in Acts 2. They are very, very similar. When preaching the Jews, Paul and Peter have the same message. They have the same method. Now they have unique introductions due to their different uh, circumstances, but the core message and the, and the common approach is the same. They agree, number one, that Jesus' own people, the Jewish leaders, instigated the death of their own Messiah. Number two, that God vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead. Number three, that this fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. And number four, that a decision is called upon, that they are bound to, to make a decision for or against Jesus. So this should put to an end any idea that, uh, that there's some sort of divide between Peter and Paul, either theologically or methodologically, or, uh, or that uh, Paul is uh, the initiator or the creator of Christianity rather than Jesus. So how does he, how does he speak to Romans? How does Paul uh, communicate to Romans? Well, his, his method with Romans is, number one, uh, he has his major interaction is uh, in the context of his trials, when he gets in trouble with Romans. And in those trials, he presents his defense at, in the expected fashion for a Roman court of law. Now, now my father was a judge, so I, I'm a J.K., I know that we've got some PKs in here, uh, pastors' kids. Uh, probably we have some MKs, missionary kids. It is tough to grow up as a JK. It's like living with a human lie detector. <laughs> my my dad used to say to us boys, "I hear better liars than you every day," <laughs> and and we really couldn't. Uh, pull anything over on him. Uh, but that wasn't the worst part of it. When, when we got in serious trouble, we got sentenced. <laughs> I'm, not, you know, I, I'm not an evangelist uh, by vocation, so I don't have to exaggerate. We got sentenced. <laughs> and, and my dad was a competitive, world-class skeet shooter. And so uh, uh, the method, the basic unit of punishment was reloading shotgun shells. And that is the most mind-numbing, brain-draining, waste of time anybody <laughs> could ever engage in. And, and well, anyway. So, but lawyers expect certain things to be done. There is a way to present evidence. And Paul is aware of this uh, in his speeches uh, before Roman authorities. But notice this. His testimony is front and center in his defenses, okay? Now, at one point, he uses uh, his knowledge of, of Roman law to get out of, uh, out of the beating. In Acts 22, uh, when he's about to be flogged, he asks a soldier uh, who's taking him to be beaten, is it legal to flog a Roman citizen without a trial? And he becomes alarmed, and he goes and gets his superior, and he comes back and he says, you're a Roman citizen? And Paul says, I am. So he, 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 he uses that knowledge very effectively. In, Philippi, in Acts uh, 16, in Philippi, after he's been beaten and imprisoned, and, and then the, the Lord sends the earthquake and that sort of thing, uh, and they want him to, to leave, he won't leave until he gets a public apology mm. because he has been legally mistreated. <coughs> now, that at first glance looks a little bit petty, but what he's actually doing is, number one, he's winning 
an audience for the gospel. Mm. And number two, he's protecting converts to Christianity. So Paul takes this opportunity uh, when he's on trial to turn these trials into opportunities to proclaim the gospel. And the thing that he most often uses is his personal testimony, which was very much part of a Roman court of law. Why are you here? Is one of the first points. Well, Paul says, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and so he takes them back to uh, when Jesus confronts him on the road to Damascus. Now here's something for us as missionaries to non-Christian religions. Our testimonies matter. Many of you have a very effective platform because you have been where some of the people that you're trying to reach presently are. And you've left. You've been delivered. You've come out. You, you, you know uh, that, that, that life is better with Christ than, than in a false gospel group. That sort of thing. And we know that the testimonies work. How, how many people have ever watched uh, a, a commercial for a weight loss product? <laughs> Before and after. That sort of thing. Testimonies have great power to persuade. And, and so we need to use our testimonies, not simply our facts, not simply our canned arguments, but personal stories appeal to people of all ages and all cultures. They have great power to persuade. And, and Paul uses his testimony with Jews in Acts 9. So never think that your testimony doesn't matter. Even if your testimony is, I was raised in church all my life. The cost to redeem you was the same. That's right. It was the blood of Christ. So never think that your testimony doesn't matter. And a changed life is one of the most powerful arguments that we have. And it gives validity to the gospel we proclaim. If Jesus hasn't changed our lives, why should we think that he could change anybody else's life? Or why should they think? that he could change their life. So, testimonies work. But both of these are somewhat predictable in that Paul was a Jew and a Roman citizen. But he also interacted with cultures different than his own. He also interacted with Greeks or Gentiles. And the most important uh, example of Paul interacting uh, with Gen with Greeks is in Acts 17 Absolutely. when he's uh, speaking to uh, the uh, Areopagus at the Are Areopagus and this is a great example of contextualization because there's a lot going on there that uh, normally just passes by us there's a lot more going on than meets uh, the 21st century American eye number one Paul couldn't appeal to the authority of uh, Hebrew scripture with Greeks. So he appealed to nature and to reason to win them. And so what Paul does is he finds a point of contact. He affirms as much as he can of their worldview or their beliefs. Exactly. And Paul also uses his knowledge of philosophy to respond to the Greeks who asked him for a reason for the hope that he had. In other words, Paul was the first Christian natural theologian. Now, a natural theologian is someone who states as much of the gospel as possible, not on the basis of scripture, but on the basis of nature, or reason alone. Now, Paul wasn't a modern-day, 21st century, Western natural theologian, but he is still going about this task of starting with nature and reason and working his way to Jesus. But, as I said, this is not obvious 
to most contemporary Western people. So maybe I'll share with you an example from my own life. After all, testimonies are very powerful. Somebody said it, right? So this is a bumper sticker that I, uh, that I saw uh, when I was pastoring in Texas. I was returning from, uh, from the VA hospital in, in Dallas, and I pulled up to an intersection, and I saw this bumper sticker. Uh, uh, for six years, my family lived in, in Germany. My father was German-speaking. And so I knew exactly uh, what it said. Wir sind ein Volk. We are one people. I didn't know, however, what it meant. Now, you have to remember, I teach cult theology. I'm a member of EMNR. <laughs> and I thought, I'll bet this is a German new age. After all, we are all one. Yeah, and, uh, and so uh, the next day, I was talking to a German friend. And I said, yeah, I saw this bumper sticker. I think it's a New Age bumper sticker. And you're saying I'm folk. And she said, du bist ein Dummkopf. You're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the Deutsche Wiedervereinigung. German reunification. Uh, exactly. <laughs> of course. Of course. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, here, here's a picture. Uh, West and East together, a future for Germany and Europe. It was what they were shouting as, they, as people milled out into the streets of Berlin where East and West were once again one people. Mm. I knew what it said, but I didn't know what it meant. And how frequently do we read over, Paul was talking to Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, but we don't know what Stoicism and Epicureanism are. So let's, uh, let's look at Acts 17 in, in more depth. And, and I, need to, I need to say this. Uh, our friend Robert M. Bowman Jr., Rob Bowman, has done some spectacular work in Acts 17. Mm. And I'm hoping and praying that he can find a, a good publisher to publish the work that he's done because he has dug into this much more deeply than I have. And he's dug into uh, some of the secondary research in this area. So, so if you like uh, the little dipping of the toe into the water that I'm going to do with you tonight, and, and you know Rob, drop him an email and say, Bob Stewart said great things about, about your work uh, in Acts 17. But uh, anyway, so four questions for us to answer uh, with regard uh, to uh, Acts 17. First question is, what did Paul see? If you're looking for that in your in your uh, handout, you're obviously type A. It's not there. Uh, don't spread it. Just let it go. Okay. Question number two. What did Paul do? Question number three. What did Paul say? And question number four. What can we learn? So what did Paul see? What did Paul do? What did Paul say? And what can we learn? So, what did Paul see? Well, Athens was a city of, of artists, of intellectuals, of philosophers, of poets, and playwrights. Athens was a great city. Athens was a wealthy city. For instance, in a moment we're going to look at a, at a, a recreation of a statue of Athena that was in the Parthenon. But the statue of Athena in the Parthenon was worth more than the entire Parthenon. It was a wealthy city. They spent money on their arts and on their gods, on their religion. And, and Paul saw a culture very much like America today. But most of all, Paul saw idolatry. When he's in Athens, he is disturbed. He is moved by the idolatry. So let's look at one of their idols. This is a, this is a statue of Athena. It's a recreation. This, this statue, was a, uh, the original, was 40 feet tall. And I think this one is, uh, is to scale, actually. I, I, I can't remember 
if this is in Athens, I, I saw a recreation of it in Athens, but I think there's also a recreation of it in Nashville. Tennessee. Yeah. Because Nashville is everything. <laughs> um, but um, nevertheless, so Athens was named after the Greek goddess Athena. And Athena was the goddess of war and wisdom. And uh, in ancient Athens, this statue uh, was made of gold and ivory. So ivory is, is over a golden statue. But the symbolism is, is really important. In her right hand, she's holding the god of victory, Nike, or Nike. And uh, you can see why uh, the Tebas Shoe Company took the, the name Nike, victory. Uh, leaning against her left side is a spear. After all, she's the goddess of war. At her feet is a large snake, and there are smaller serpents coming out of her head. Now understand this, that, that seems really creepy, doesn't it? Uh, but snakes were seen as a source of wisdom and healing, and that's why we have our, uh, our medical symbol is, is a post with two serpents intertwined going up around it. And, and there actually were see healing sites in ancient Greece where, where people would go and, and lie down because snakes would come there, or they were actually put there, captured and put there. And, and if, if a snake crawled over you during the night, they believed that you would be healed. Uh, I, I know, that's creepy, but we're talking about other worldviews, right? And notice her shield. It symbolizes her protection and wisdom. So, Here's what some ancient uh, thinkers said about Athens. This is from Xenophon, uh, one of Socrates' uh, disciples or students. He says that, that Athens is one great altar, one great sacrifice to the gods. Or this is Petronius, uh, a philosopher playwright. He says, it is easier to meet a god in the street than a man. It's easier to meet a god on the street of Athens than a man. Now, when Paul was there, uh, scholars estimate that, that there were 30,000 public idols in the city of Athens. Not private household idols, public idols. And Athens had a population, apart from festivals, of 25,000. <laughs> Petronius was right. You can more easily meet a god on the street of Athens than a man. So what did he see? He saw a city steeped in idolatry and excess. Question number two, what did Paul do? Well, verse 17 tells us that he reasoned with the Athenians. And he used reason to respond to their idolatry. Let me, let me say this very clearly. Biblical faith is not opposed to a well-reasoned thing. Amen. And, and I know that I don't need to stress that to members of EMNR, but sometimes we need that, right? Yep. But what is not biblical is a Christian who doesn't think as well as possible. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Everything that you are, but far too many Christians haven't even developed their minds to be able to love God with their mind. So if, if you're a Christian, it's your duty to think well. If you're a Christian and you're a student, it's your duty to God to study hard, to be the best student you can. And more than that, ideas matter. Because ideas influence how we live. Spiritual warfare is primarily about ideas. Because ideas influence how we live. When we get off on, on these uh, uh, creepy Hollywood movie kind of things, and, uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm so old. Rosemary's Baby and the Exorcist oh, and the yeah. previous <laughs> millennium. Yeah. I, I really think that, that Satan is just fine with us worrying about that sort of thing. Second Corinthians 
uh, chapter 10, uh, is, is uh, probably the best verse that we have uh, to talk about spiritual warfare. Verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have the divine power to destroy strongholds. The strongholds that Paul is talking about are intellectual strongholds. Exactly. Fortresses, mental fortresses, ideas, non-Christian ideas that we uncritically accept without knowing right, right. them. And then once we become aware of it, they have such a hold on us because frequently they come with practices that are addictive in, in nature. And, and you might say, well, how do you know that, that Paul has ideas in mind in, in 2 Corinthians 10? Because of verse 5. We destroy arguments mm -hmm. and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Can you see it? So they bring Paul to the Areopagus. Because uh, they want to hear more about these new gods, plural, that he's talking about. In verse 18 of Acts 17, they say, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities, plural. Because Paul was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. And they seem to think that the Greek word for resurrection, anastasis, is, uh, is a god. Okay, so now it's not exactly clear to scholars what's going on here. One school of thought says they're putting Paul on trial for his strange ideas. Now remember this, that, that's not that strange an idea. Socrates was tried at this very spot for introducing strange gods to the youth of Athens. Yeah, Socrates really lost his life because he was a troublemaker. <laughs> but, uh, but the formal charge was introducing strange gods to the youth of Athens. Now, I don't think that's a crazy idea, but I think it's wrong. That's not what's going on with Paul. Socrates was tried in 399 B.C., over 400 years before Paul came to Athens. And Athens was a completely, well, it's not completely different, but it was a lot different city in 399 B.C. than it was in the first century when Rome was in charge. I think what they really wanted to do was just mess with it, poke fun at the Jew. That's what they wanted to do. Notice in, in verse 18, they say, well, let's hear what this idle babbler would have to say. Right, right. Or literally, the Greek there means seed picker. This country bumpkin, this, this guy who thinks he knows something. But ultimately, I think they really just wanted to hear him out. To see if, they're, if they had perhaps missed one or two gods. <laughs> you know, and they had 30,000, but you know, we could use 30,000 and two. We can never have too many gods, right? And they wanted to manage his beliefs for their own agenda. They were trying to fit Paul's theology into their mold. And there are people today that would love for us to get in mind, would love to fit our beliefs into their agenda. We are very much like first century Athens in 21st century America. There are people today who are fine with us being committed Christians, meeting as often as we want, selling and writing as many books as we want, singing as many praise songs as we want, so long as we adapt our beliefs to this. Mm. So, what's going on when Paul defends the faith to Epicurean <coughs> and Stoic philosophers? Well, here's a bit 
of what Epicureans believed. The Epicureans were, were sort of like the new atheist or the material naturalist of today. They, they believed uh, they were strict materialists. All is matter. They were polytheists. Now that, that might sound odd that they're, everything's material and there are plenty of gods, but the Mormons are strict materialists. And they're also polytheists. Uh, so God and souls, they don't deny the reality of, of the divine. They don't deny, deny the reality of the soul, but God and souls are material. And humans are essentially animals. And at death, you just cease to exist. The Stoics have some things in common with them, but they also have some differences. The first three are exactly the same. The Stoics are materialists, the polytheists, gods and souls are material. Um, okay, there you go. Still, it's the first, the same first three. Historical determinists, uh, some of them had a cyclical view of history. For instance, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, you know, he was a real person, not just a character at the beginning of Gladiator. Uh, that that sort of sort of thing. And uh, and the Stoics believed that there was a spark of the divine logos, which was an impersonal principle that ordered the universe. That that a spark of the divine logos was in everyone. And that at death you rejoin the logos. So essentially, the differences between the Stoics and the Epicureans are not about whether uh, reality is material or matter and mind or matter and spirit, but it, it's about it's about anthropology. It's about our identity, who we are, and what happens when we die. Now these are really important questions. Who are we? And what happens when we die? Those are fundamental worldview questions. And they're fundamental philosophical questions. Please understand this. Philosophy isn't about abstract issues that only eggheads care about. <laughs> Philosophy is about finding the best possible. The greatest of the ancient philosophers said this, for man, the unexamined life is not worth living. I would agree and add this, the unexamined faith is not worth believing. So Christianity is the best philosophy of all. Now, let me say very clearly, Christianity is more than a philosophy. But it's not less than a philosophy. Okay? It's at least a philosophy. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what Paul saw and, uh, and what Paul did. What did Paul say? Well, first off, he finds a point of contact. He finds a point of contact. Verse 22, he says, I observe that you're very religious in every respect, that, that uh, you don't live lives uh, that are that are compartmentalized uh, like Americans do. Uh, what, you, what you believe about uh, philosophy, about life, about metaphysics, about religion, theology, these things actually, you're looking out. I compliment you for that. And then he begins to quote their authorities. Right. Look at Acts uh, 17, verse 28. And I'm going to quote from the King James Version, or good news for medieval man, and, uh, <laughs> because I think it brings it out really well. Uh, for in him we live and move and have our being, mm -hmm. as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Now this quotation comes from Epimenides. Now Epimenides was a was a sixth century BC uh, poet and philosopher, and uh, and 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 he was like the patron saint of of Athens because in the sixth century BC Athens uh, was undergoing a plague, 
And they, they didn't seem to know how to, to deal with it. So they, they said, well, let's get Epimenides. He's, he's a really smart guy. We'll bring him here, and he'll diagnose our situation and tell us what to do. And Epimenides said, well, you offer a sacrifice to the God who was offended. They, they said, well, we've already offered sacrifices to all the gods we know. You ever wondered where that to the unknown God came from? Epimenides said, well, then you just don't know all the gods. Well, how will we figure it out? Well, release a sheep. And wherever the sheep rests, sacrifice them there. And they did. And lo and behold, the plague ended. But there's more. The last part of verse... 28, for we too are his offspring, is a quotation from a 3rd century B.C. Stoic philosopher named Aratus. And his poem, Phenomena, was a well-known constellation poem. And so Paul uses reason. He says, I know you guys. I'm not a seed picker. Who do you call a seed picker? And he speaks meaningfully to them. He speaks relevantly to them by talking about what they care about. Now, why do I say that he talks about what they care about? Because Greek philosophers were consumed with three things. They didn't have the same answer to the, to the three questions that they were consumed with, but they were consumed with three questions. Number one, what is the meaning of life? Why are we here? Number two, cause and effect. How does nature work? And number three, the nature of reality. What does it mean to be? You know, Hamlet's question, to be or not to be? But what does it mean to be? So Paul speaks to these things. Verse 28, in him we live. He's the reason. And move. That's cause and effect. You, we've heard these arguments about the prime mover. When, when we use a, when Aristotle argues from, from motion to a prime mover, uh, he, he's not talking about a bowl rolling across the floor. He's talking about growth and change, so, uh, development. He's talking about uh, bullfrogs come from tadpoles. And caterpillars turn into butterflies. It's motion and change, but it's orderly. It's consistent. And him is the answer to life. And the, and the answer for, for development and the change that we see in the, in the world of nature around us, and we exist. We have our being. That is what they care about. And Paul says to them, what you've been looking for is a philosophy, but it's all wrapped up in a person, and his name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. But he gets their attention by scratching where they're itching, <laughs> by talking about what they care about in terms that they can understand. He pushes their buttons by talking meaningfully to them. But understand this. Contextualization is not the whole task. Contextualization only gets you so far. Because Paul says two other things. He says, God raised Jesus from the dead. And by this man whom he raised from the dead, he's going to judge the world. And that is too much for most of his audience. Because the idea of resurrection was not one bit consistent with any Greek philosophical system. Not simply Stoicism or Epicureanism. The Platonists didn't believe it. The, the, the Neoplatonists, the Middle Platonists couldn't stand the idea. In fact, the Council of the Areopagus itself had been founded on these words. When a man dies, the earth drinks up his blood. There is no resurrection. Mm. And that's from Aeschylus. 
in his Eumenides, 458 BC. So Paul challenges their worldviews as well as commending what he can. He finds a point of contact, but he also points out points of departure. Resurrection and post-mortem judgment. Here's a, here's a, here's a, a gravestone. And you'll find uh, this, this saying all over the Mediterranean world. Now it's in Latin, not in Greek. Non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. Translation. I was not, I was. I am not, I care not. And that's attributed to Epicurus, the founder of the Epicureans. And the Epicureans say, when you die, you just cease to exist. You come and you go, but you're nothing but an intelligent animal. But understand this, resurrection is a non-negotiable part of Mm -hmm. Every sermon that we find in the book of Acts includes the resurrection. And basically, what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, no resurrection, no hope. So after contextualizing the gospel, we must challenge their world with the gospel. We contextualize the gospel as much as possible, and then we challenge with the gospel. Because we cannot compromise on the truth, no matter how offensive it may be in some cultures. Brothers and sisters, the gospel is a scandal. But we need to make certain that the gospel is the scandal not we who deliver in the gospel. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing in Acts 17 is at the end, some people believed mm -hmm. and became followers of Jesus. I've actually heard people uh, preach this passage and say, well, Paul, when he went to Athens, got all philosophical and it didn't work. <laughs> Some means at least one and possibly all. And we know it wasn't all. But he names, Luke names some of the people. Dionysius, the Areopagite, which means that he had disciples. And presumably some of them would have become believers. And a woman named Damaris and others with them. And the gospel was unpopular in the main in first century Athens. It's not all that popular, the real gospel, in 21st century America. But understand this, the gospel was also powerful enough to change lives in first century Athens, and it's powerful Amen. enough to change Amen. lives in 21st century America. Amen. It is our only hope. It's through the proclamation of the gospel that people come to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. Only the gospel can make dead men live mm -hmm. and blind men see. Mm -hmm. So, question number four. What can we learn from Paul? Well, number one, we learn that the gospel is for everyone, every race, in every place. Every race, every place. Number two, we learn that truth is constant, but different cultures learn truth differently. You don't share with the Mormon the same way you share with the New Atheist. You don't share with a Jehovah's Witness the same way you share with a Muslim. That sort of thing. We need to understand different worldviews so that we can speak meaningfully and relevantly to them. We need to know enough to push their buttons like Paul was pushing the Athenians' buttons. Mm. We need to affirm what we can. We don't dare become the people that hate everything. <laughs> and that is largely the reputation that us cup busters have. Not only in the secular <laughs> world, but even among our fellow believers. We need to affirm what we can and critique what is wrong. 
Finally, we, we cannot compromise on the truth. Contextualization must not become a compromise. So what we need to do is focus on Jesus, judgment, grace, and resurrection. Jesus, judgment, grace, and resurrection. So, one, one other thing. Did anybody notice that everyone in Athens believed in some sort of God? So much of the time, as someone who directs a Christian apologetics program at the Southern Baptist Seminary, what I see in so many apologetics conferences is such a concern with atheism when the truth of the matter is most believers are not atheists. Most believers have some kind of religious belief. And this is the group that's trying most to reach religious unbelievers. But we could ask this question also, who is your mission team? And I don't mean what group is your mission team. I mean, is John your mission field? Is Susan your mission field? Is Dominique your mission field? Because we, we will not win Hinduism to Jesus, but you might win Hindu. We're not going to convert the entire Mormon religion. E even, if, even if we could put together the best uh, YouTube video in the history of the world, <laughs> we wouldn't win the entire Mormon church to Jesus. We might win a Mormon to Jesus. Mm. And he might win enough. That sort of thing. So the, the, the question is, who is your mission to? Mm. How do you need to share with, to, with them in your context? If I have time, I don't know if I do, I, I tend to talk a lot. Uh, do you have any questions uh, about anything that I say? Yes, Dave. Yeah, when it comes to the uh, issue of what is truth, mm -hmm. it came up earlier in the conference too. He had a certain response to Pontius Pilate. But in John 17, he talks, thy word is truth. Right. Yeah, in terms of the cultural context, the approach in terms of how to communicate where it's needed. Okay, so, so the question, uh, probably live stream couldn't hear it, was uh, Jesus said in John 17, thy word is truth, in his great priestly prayer, high priestly prayer. Yeah. Uh, but when he's talking to, to Pontius Pilate, he says, I am the truth, I believe. Or those who, the, those who uh, recognize us are of the truth. Mm -hmm. and, and Pilate says, what is truth? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is a question that warms my philosopher's heart. Oh, <laughs> I, you know, I love me some of his names. But... Pilate then walks out. Mm -hmm. and, and lots of times today, people use that question not as a thought starter, but as a thought stopper. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, so uh, I hear questions like, uh, well, that's your truth. It's not, not my truth. Or there's no such thing as truth. And, and, and we know how to respond quickly to, to those sorts of things. Well, is it true that there's no such thing as truth? And uh, that sort of thing. But what I think most people mean is that nobody can really be certain about most things. Now, there are some things that we can have certainty about, logical certainty about, but religion is just not one of those things. We can have 100% confidence, not 100% logical certainty. Um, several years ago, uh, I'll share a personal testimony with you because I've heard those are persuasive. Um, <laughs> one of my colleagues came to me and said, I'd like you to have lunch with my college-age son and me. And 
and uh, he said, my son's going through a, a severe crisis of faith. Mm. And I thought, well, that's not much pressure. <laughs> but we, we went out to lunch, and, and so I just started asking him questions. His dad had told me that he'd read the Philip Pullman novels, and, and that had led him into some other things. And, and, um, but I didn't act like I knew anything at all. I just started asking him questions, because I really wanted to hear him say it in his own words. And, and pretty quickly, I, I thought, OK, I'm picking up on where he's coming from. And so then I summarized back to him what I thought he was telling me. So I said, and, and this is a strategy to use. Ask me questions, listen respectfully to what they say. Not just ask a, a rhetorical question, not just a gotcha question. And, and then don't, don't have your response you know, I'm going to cut them off at the knees with my next question. Mm. Right. Um, really try to communicate. And so I said to him, so if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're telling me is that you think the evidence for Christianity is pretty good. But that since it's not 100% clear, and yet Christianity calls for a 100% existential commitment in your life, you're having questions about your commitment to Christ. He said, that's it exactly. I wish I could have put it that well. And I said, so, I guess you're never going to get married. Now, he's a 19-year-old, red-blooded American male. He says, I'm going to get married. And I said, but you can't have certainty. Of a, no, no. First off, I said, would you like to get married? He said, I'm going to get married. Then I said, when you get married, would you like a woman who's always faithful to you? Or would it be OK if she cheated on you from time to time, like, say, <laughs> once every leap year? And uh, he said, I want a woman who's faithful to me all the time. And I said, so then you're never going to get married. I'm going to get married. But you can't be certain. Because how would you be certain that she never cheated on you? I mean, after all, I mean, you might go take the car in to get fixed and she'd sleep with the mailman or something like that. <laughs> and he, he said, well, you know, yeah. And the light bulb came on that he didn't need 100% existential certainty. But understand this, marriage is a relationship just like Christianity. It's a covenant relationship just like mm. Christianity. And he began to see that I don't have to have 100% logical certainty. What, what I need is an adequate reason to believe. Mm -hmm. And he'd already said that the evidence of Christianity was really pretty good. And today that, that young man is a, is a graduate of Southeastern Seminary. He's walking with the Lord, has a godly family. And uh, I, I really think that many times these questions of truth are just smoke screens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people, if we make them hungry for the truth, they will seek it. And, and mm. Scripture tells, tells us, you will find me when you seek it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Other questions? All right. Okay, yeah. Okay. First of all, this is the best talk I've heard all, all day. Uh, <laughs> well, you haven't heard very many. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I guess I just have a, a minor, maybe a minor little point of difference. Um, you talked about how um, you know, have, nobody here has to be persuaded that reason is, uh, that you know, faith can be reasonable. You said that Christians should be thinking well. Um, and I agree we should love our heart with all our minds. I said nobody, nobody in Eden and are. Yeah, 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 that's what I mean. Not, yeah, in yeah, our yeah, broader yeah, culture, yeah. that yeah, is okay. not at all the case. Right. Right. Now, I agree with you on mm -hmm. that. I guess I have to tell you that sometimes I, I go back and forth on this. Sometimes I feel like a recovering intellectual. Because I, I I love the all the all the intellectual rigor you put into this talk, and I love all the, the 
persuasive. I think it's beautiful. But then I look at, I also look at the limitations of apologetics and the limitations of what we do. Because, you know, Paul says, you know, I didn't come to you with persuasive speech. You know, he says at the end of 1 Corinthians 1, yeah. you know, I didn't come to you. I just came to in preaching Christ and Him crucified. And he talks about, the, you know, the, the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And, and so I, 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 I don't, I guess I, 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 again, I go back and forth on this because I feel like, like um, Christianity is definitely not opposed to reason, but I also think there are more important things in the world than the life of the mind. Um, it's funny you mentioned marriage. I'm, I'm a single guy, and I'm still looking for a girlfriend. Uh, but, you know, I, I, believe it or not, intellect is the least important thing to me when I look at, you know, a, a person that I'm interested in. I just want someone I can have a, What's more important to me is depth. And so if someone is deep, I don't care if they're simple. So anyway, just kind of wanted you to address some yeah. of what I just <clears throat> So that was sort of the live stream, and the question was uh, about the limitations of apologetics. And, and I absolutely affirm that. Uh, apologetics is, is not the silver bullet right. uh, of Christian ministry. It's, it's an essential part of Christian ministry. You will be a better theologian if you have an apologist mindset, and, you know, I, I, it's amazing how much better my, my students can understand the doctrine of the Trinity after they talk to a Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it becomes more real oh, as yeah. an issue uh, for them. Uh, but you will also be a better apologist if, you, if you're a good theologian. Sure. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the single, well, loving God and loving others is the single most important thing. But, this, the most important tool you can have, not an attitude, is be a good theologian. Mm. If you're not a good theologian, you'll have to wait until somebody puts something up on YouTube to know something that's cult. But if you're a good theologian, you'll recognize cult because you'll know the truth. So I, I, I absolutely would say reason only takes us so far. I would agree with Pascal when he says the heart has its reasons which reason does not know. And, and so uh, at the beginning of the section where Pascal has his wager, there's a little heading, um, something like, and I'm not going to quote it perfectly, but it's something like uh, the, the task is to make good men desire God. And so the wager is, is not about, at least in my view, it's, it's been interpreted differently. Um, but in my view, the wager is about uh, showing that the most reasonable position is to hope that God exists, to desire God to exist. And then Pascal says, then you enter into the life of a Christian. And Pascal's a Catholic, so you go to Mass, you, you take the Mass, you pray the prayers, you read the Scripture, and God will make himself so certain in your heart that you don't need an argument. And, and so... I, I would absolutely uh, affirm that apologetics without, apart from the spirit and the living word of God and the love of the apologist is, is almost always going to be a clanging bell or a clanging symbol or an empty bell, penny bell, that sort of thing. And so without love, it's not that. Uh, I would just like to say that it was very good what you said. Uh, Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples, everyone will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. And I just want to say, people don't care how much you know until you know they they care how much you care. How much you care. Yeah. They don't want to know how much you care. Yeah. That's important. But knowledge is important because my people perish in Hosea for lack of knowledge. Yeah. But so it's all, it's all knowledge and love, too. Yeah. Amen. Faith and reason, love and knowledge. <coughs> all right. May I close this out in prayer? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's been a long day. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> Father, I thank you that you gave your son for us. and that your spirit penetrated in our hearts and that your word is living and active. It's the sword of the spirit. 
Lord, I thank you that we have hope. I pray that we will share this hope persuasively, powerfully, humbly, relying on you to move in the hearts and minds of those with whom we interact. I pray for the rest of this conference, for all of our speakers, and for those we will speak to after as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.